Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Uh, hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. So uh, currently, I am a key accounts manager and territory manager for a global OEM in the machining industry. Uh, so deal with the uh, CapEx, the complex sale in the CapEx space. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just out there uh, moving machinery. A pretty easy sale. Uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's a tough sale. <laughs> it's a tough sale. We, we deal with uh, efficiency products. So it's a, it's a highly educated uh, product. Uh, we spend a lot of time telling our customers, convincing them why they need and why yeah. they should do and all that good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty tough. Well, what's an average deal size, roughly 100K, 200K? We, we, deal with, we deal with everybody from the mom and pop all the way up to large uh, automotive, uh, aerospace, and, and uh, medical. So anywhere from 10000 up to a million dollars. Okay. And yeah. do you get any inbound or is it all outbound? Um, we do get some inbound. Fortunately for me, our company has a very recognizable name. So okay. we do get customers that reach out to us, but we do a lot of both. So, yeah. yeah. And highly competitive. Highly competitive. Um, it's highly competitive and it's highly uh, volatile, right? So, you know, based on, based on automotive, you know, kind of the wind blows, right? So, um, when automotive is good, then sales are good. When automotive isn't, then, then sales aren't so good. So you have to work a little harder. And what's the sales cycle? Is it it's probably pretty long? Uh, yeah, anywhere from, well, I mean, you can hit quick on, on a small guy, you know, in a couple of weeks all the way up to two years. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. how do you prioritize your pipeline? Um, typically, the pipeline is prioritized by who is the hottest to buy <laughs> right, right now, now. <laughs> right? Chasing yeah. the sale. We, we do a lot of chasing the sale. Um, we, we believe that's the best way. You know, we go where the customer has the need and, and you know, we show up, uh, you know, uh, to those customers. So, and yeah. What's your patch like? Is it geographic named accounts? Yeah, so so I have a national key accounts, um, but I also have a territory, which is a one state territory. So I have, yeah. Which state? Yeah, uh, Michigan. Oh, North so, Dakota. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, not North Dakota. I have I have what we call the 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 honey hole, right? That's Michigan. Uh, lots of manufacturing in Michigan. You know, yeah. the obviously the big automotive is there. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty busy handling those guys. And how much time do you spend on the mom and pops? If it... um, well, in my role now, I mean, I used to, so I started as a sales engineer um, and carrying uh, demo equipment in the back of a van and, and showing up and doing demos. Um, that's, that's where I started, but now I, I handle mostly the, the, you know, the big accounts. Um, but I still love to walk into the mom and pops with, with my background um, I, I just, I mean, that's where my true love is with the smaller companies. So I, I take the time to get out with the engineers and, and, you know, get my hands dirty with the little guys. Yeah. So yeah, and, it's about 70, it's about 70, 30 big, big guys to little guys now. Yeah. But, and how know. do you differentiate yourself as a rep? Well, so, um, my background in this industry is, is pretty, uh, different. I mean, getting into sales was not a, forecasted uh, <laughs> it wasn't a forecasted in high school uh, career I want to be a rat. no <laughs> so so I was part of a family business for uh, I had a uh, my family had a business for 50 years I was third generation took over the business ran that business for 13 years unfortunately had to close it back in 2014 and quite honestly out of desperation I applied for an inside sales position uh, for for this company and and um, obviously they, they recognized that I was no inside sales guy. So they put me on the road with the demo equipment and, yeah. uh, you know, three promotions later, uh, here I am. But what really differentiates me is that I used to buy equipment in the same space I sell okay. now. Good. So now I understand the questions that need to be asked. And I understand that there's, that there's, uh, parts of the business, uh, that, might not seem like they relate to the sale, 
but ultimately that's, those are the things that differentiate me. Like, for example, um, you know, we have a, a simple ROI calculator for our equipment, right? That our company gives us and, and our reps go out and hand them out and say, oh, you know, put your numbers in here. But if you actually go in and ask the customer, how do you calculate ROI, right? It's gonna be completely different from, you know, what we think, right? So, so when we go in and, and we ask those questions to the customers, how do you calculate? What's important to you? You know, how do you wanna see this payback or return? Um, it, it, it puts us at a different level, right? It, it allows us to, to talk to them at a much different level than what our competitors are talking to them at. Yeah, I, I love so. that first question. This is open-ended and it, it gives you everything you need. What's most important yeah. to you? Exactly. Well, and, and that's, that's really, I mean, so I approach sales a little bit differently. I, I, I don't look at it as sales. I look at it like I'm a doctor writing a prescription, right? So when I go into a customer, my, my only focus is on helping that customer. You know, sometimes it's with our products and sometimes, you know, I have to walk away, you know, because our products aren't a fit. But ultimately, I'm not trying to push anything. What I want to do is ask them the questions get to know about their business. And from, from having bought this equipment in the past, Brian, I, I understand that what I wanted was I wanted a, you know, a salesman who would take the time to know my business. Yeah. Right. That's, and that's the important thing is, as far as I'm concerned. So let's walk through it. You walk sure. in, they, they typically tell me, you know, who you are, what do you do? Yep. How's it work? Right. So, right. and if we fall into that trap, we're dead, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The show up and throw up, you know, it just, it doesn't work, especially, especially in a complex sale, you know, it just doesn't work. Um, so typically I'll go in and, and, you know, I'm talking to engineering managers, I'm talking to, you know, plant managers, operations managers, all the way up to the CEO. And, and what I ask them is what are your biggest challenges? What, what are you working on right now? What are the problems you're trying to solve? Uh, once, once I can get them to open up and, and start telling me some of those things, then I can tailor the responses back to them, you know, walking them on a path towards the products that, you know, that we have. So, but, but sometimes those questions can lead you down the wrong road, meaning that the, their challenges have nothing to do with your product. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's true. And you have to quickly kind of realign that, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, you know, get back to maybe ask them some leading questions like, you know, how are your delivery times? How are your, you know, whatever, like I said, we're in the efficiency space. So getting back to, you know, that you can, you can kind of come back to that. But, but um, to answer your question though, the things that are bothering them, even though they don't relate to me, they may relate to me. Yeah. Right. So understanding what those biggest challenges are, are really important to tailor the entire package. So it's never it's never a bad thing to listen to that stuff and then kind of kind of pick them through because let's say they're having a problem with delivery time, right? I don't sell I don't sell products that are going to help in delivery time per se, um, but I do sell a product that can get their I, I sell a product that can get their machine parts done faster, more efficiently. So, so now I can walk them back to that as a, you know, as a determining factor towards their d delay in delivery times, right? Does that make sense? Sure does. And, and how do yeah. you get, you know, because I'm sure they want to commoditize you. Yes. Right. Because always. they always have power. If you're a commodity, I have the power. Right. If you're special, right. you have the power. Right. Exactly. So how do you, how do you make sure that doesn't happen? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's all in the, you know, it, it's all in the value proposition, right? So, um, in order to not be commoditized, we take a, a we take care in, in, in basically explaining to them the value that we can bring to them that nobody else can bring. Right. And that, and that once, once that hits Brian, exactly that yeah. I've got them right where I want them. Right. As far as the sale goes. Yeah. Once, once they acknowledge that our product has a value that nobody else can bring to them, it's over. We're done. So, and how can you tell when they get it? Because 
everyone's saying that, but so boy, that's a, that's a great question. Um, how can I tell when they get it? Uh, there is that moment. Um, typically when they ask how much, <laughs> typically, <laughs> typically when they, when they start talking about numbers, um, oh. that's a, certainly a buying signal. Um, but I've, I've actually had very frank conversations with customers where they've almost kicked me out of their facility, you know, before we got down to, to that point. Right. And when that light comes on though, um, yeah, typically they're, they're starting to ask questions of how quick can I get it? You know, yeah. how much is it going to cost me? Those types of things. And, and how do you create urgency with it as far as do it today versus <clears throat> do it a year from now? Well, I mean, for us, we can show a payback or return in our, in our equipment in like less than four months. So I, I, I have a famous, uh, I, I, I say to my customers, um, I give them the Henry Ford quote, you know, if you, if you need a piece of equipment and don't buy it, you're already paying for it and not getting it, right? So, so I basically, you know, give them the doomsday clock and say, hey, man, for every, you know, 10 minutes, you don't have this piece of equipment, you're, you know, you're losing money. Yeah. So, so typically we can, we can do it that way. Um, it, but you know, we don't strong arm a sale. I, at least I don't strong arm a sale. Right. I, right, I, I but don't, yeah. yeah don't use high pressure. To focus tactics. on something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Focus. We, we like to focus on what they're losing now, you know, yeah. what they could and what they could be paying for right, right now, you know? So, but, but how about, you know, because ROI is very powerful when you're talking to the owner or somebody yeah. who owns the yeah. budget. But yeah. if, if you're talking to somebody who doesn't have any control or interest, they care about what it does for them. Yep. Yeah, you have to be very careful with that because um, a lot of times even the young reps will get kind of trapped in that, right? So, you know, understand who you're talking to and what's important to them. I'll tell you a good story, Brian. I had a, a young rep uh, underneath me. He's a, he's a sales engineer. He came to me and said, hey, I'd like to offer – you know, something to try to close this deal. I want to offer them free shipping. And I said, okay, are you sure that free shipping is, is a value to them? Right. Do they care about it? Well, he did it and he found out that shipping doesn't even go into, you know, the manufacturing manager's budget. It's, it's rolled out. It doesn't hit their CapEx, you know, budget. So, you know, it didn't mean anything to them. Yeah. He ended up having to, to give them the free shipping and give them a discount on top of that. So, you know, it's really important to go in and ask those questions, right? What is important to you? Yeah. What, you know, is, is free shipping of value or, or is it not? And a lot of times, you know, um, you're, you're going to end up doubling up on your discounts if you, uh, you know, offer them something they don't care about. Yeah. And what I love about that question is you can get a false positive. Like if you, I sold to engineers most of my life. Yeah. And if, if I asked what was important to you and the engineer said cost, I knew it was a false pot. Engineers have no control over the budget. Right. If cost is important, that means they wanted to go under the radar. Right. <laughs> Which yeah. means it's not going to be a big deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, exactly. and you, that's it. And if you're talking to a finance person and they don't mention cost or ROI, you, you know, it's a false positive. They say, oh, right. you know, number of widgets per hour. You know, it's yep. like something that, that, that they have to care about. Yeah. And, and, and I think the important thing is, especially for like the younger guys, I mentor, you know, a lot of guys in our company, we have about 30 reps. And um, what I tell them is understand who you're talking to and the personality of that person. Right. So, you know, you kind of have to tailor if, if you have that operator guy, who's hundred percent company, what's best for the company you know, works 60 hours a week and, and only cares about, you know, the results, you've got to be, you can't talk about things like price and, and those things. They don't matter to him, right? Yeah. Well, what's it going to do for, for them and, and the, the company overall? So, yeah, yeah and, a lot of times we have to tailor that. And when you mentor somebody, you kind of see the, the, the stages that you went through as a rep. Yeah. What, what were some of those kind of major epiphanies where the lights went on and all of a sudden you go, I've been wasting a lot of time doing dumb stuff. I got to start yeah. doing this. Yeah. It brings a smile to my face. Cause I spent, you know, my time, even though fairly short in sales, I spent my time, like I said, driving around with demo equipment in the back of a van. Right. And 
I'd show up and I'd go through the demonstration, a 30 minute demonstration features and benefits and, and the blank stares and the, you know, the operator's faces and, um, you know, and what I realized is that everybody doesn't care about everything. Right. right? So, so a lot of times you have to very quickly figure out what they care about and then tailor, you know, your demonstration, tailor your, your conversation directly to what they care about. Nothing um, else. <laughs> ev everything else is for my benefit, right? Everything yeah. else. I mean, it's great that I can stand up and do a 30 minute, you know, and uh, demonstration and show every feature. But if they don't care about it, it's only for me. It's not for them. Right. They just, the brain turns off. And I bet you at yeah. that early stage, you were excited at the end of the day, the oh, most yeah. number of demos you gave. Right. And, and, and the funny thing is, is that my demos went from 30 minutes to about five minutes. Um, I would show up and set up the equipment for half an hour and, and get everybody in front and be done in, in less than five minutes. Because yeah. in, the, in the time, I, I, I was able to hone in on just what they wanted, you know, and, and, and show them exactly what they want. And then I call it the drop the mic moment, you know, and then stand back and, and, and let them talk. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Because yeah. usually it is, it usually comes down to like one thing. Exactly. That, 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 that they'll remember that they value that you do that nobody else does. Yeah. I was traveling with uh, my, one of my sales engineers, he's 23 years old and you know, he was showed up to do a customer demonstration and I was standing back watching and um, the funny part was he was uh, he was asking them if they used a certain tool and literally right behind him, Brian, was the whole wall of those types of tools, right? So he, he, he couldn't see the forest through the trees. He was so intent on doing this demonstration that he didn't see the whole wall of, of, of what he was asking them if they used behind him. Yeah. You know, to me, that's just an experience. I mean, you have to pay attention. You have to take in the surroundings when you're with, when you have the chance to be face to face and then you have to be direct and to the point and, and you know, to their needs. So and, what they care about. And the reps that come to you for help come to you to, to talk through uh, what they're mm -hmm. facing. What, what do you typically see them doing wrong or less than perfect? Well, I think number one, um, that, again, a really good question. I think number one is they talk too much. Yeah. Um, and don't listen enough. I mean, and, and that's kind of cliche in the sales world that you hear people say that. Uh, but even though people know it, they don't get it, right? Um, let the customer drive that sales visit. I mean, for me, it's easy. Like I said, I'm like a doctor writing a prescription. I walk in, I start the conversation, I sit back and listen. And as I'm listening in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, here's the products that I know can help them, but I don't tell them. I don't tell them until it's the right time to tell them, right? So yeah. I sit back, let them talk through. Uh, a lot of times they will commit to buying a machine for me before I even pitch the machine. You know, even before we get to that point, they know they need exactly what I'm selling. Yeah, and I think that's it. It's by far the number one thing, the talking too much. And I think they feel obligated to talk. Right. I don't think it's even that they want to talk. They just feel it's their job. Yeah. And they don't have the confidence to have that pregnant pause. Right. Yeah, just exactly. Ask a nice open-ended question and sit back. Yeah. Pop, pop some popcorn. Pop some cop popcorn and watch, watch the Watch the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very... <laughs> yeah, it's. it's... I mean... Obviously, a lot of people think that sales is just talking, right? I mean, I think used car salesmen or whatever give that, you know, kind of a bad name, you know, in sales. But really, we need to listen. We need to evaluate. We need to analyze. Yeah. Um, and then and then we need to propose, you know, a solution to help after we understand their business. And I think when I, when I was buying this equipment, Brian, that's really the guys that stood out to me were the guys that really understood my business. And so for me, as I, as I mentor these guys, I try to make these young guys understand, hey, understand the business first and then propose a solution after, right? Yeah. And, and that's just kind of how it, how it plays out, so. That's it, because I think, because after you leave and you call in, 
to, to either, mm -hmm. you know, get an update or see where the deal is or push the deal to the next step. They either want to talk to you or have to talk to you. Right. You want them to want to talk with you. Absolutely. So Absolutely. if you don't have any value or even if it's just an enjoyable interaction. Yeah. Yeah. You got to ask yourself, why are they going to talk to me? Exactly. Well, and, and, and that's, that's a, that's a great point. And a lot of times what happens, um, our, our young reps are afraid to ask questions because they're afraid they won't understand the answers and know how to have a conversation. Yeah. So they just avoid, you know, the questions, you know, about let's say ROI or, or, or other parts of their business. Now, if they're talking specifically about our machinery, they know everything, right? They can talk about that. But you start getting into how do you, you know, how do you cost account? How do you, you know, what, what, are the, what are the other departments that might benefit from, from the use of this? You know, they just, you know, the, the, the reps stay away from that like the plague because they don't want to be vulnerable to the customer. Um, what I found is that vulner vulnerability to the customer can be uh, completely endearing to the customer, right? They might be more trusting of you because you admit, hey, I don't quite understand what you're doing here. Or, you know, can you explain this to me or, or whatever? Um, that actually creates the relationship that'll get them to want to talk to you in the future. Right. Yeah, because trust right. is showing more interest in their concerns than your own. Sure. And when you Absolutely. say, you know, let me tell you what we can't do. Or if, right. if this is not a match, I'll point you in the right direction. Absolutely. You know, you know that's yeah. our concern for them. Yeah. And, and that's hard. How about as far as like being emotionally attached to each outcome instead of the focus being on getting the right thing for the customer? Um, I mean, obviously, so, so I, I kind of think it's a hybrid of both. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I kind of, I get emotionally attached first and then, and then, and then I'm driven to make sure that it's right, you know, to make sure that they're successful. So the last couple of years, I've been really focusing on that customer experience piece, right? That, you know, we've all heard that those, the catch word customer experience, it's kind of the new thing, right? And, um, but I, I really do believe you have to be emotionally attached. You have to, you have to want care. to, you have to care, you have to help. If, if, it, if it's just at the end of the day, if it's just about a sale for your commission, you're going to lose. Yeah. You're going to lose um, because, because the customers will see that and it'll drive that process, right? Um, so when you care to, to not only uh, get the customer the right thing and move them forward, uh, the customers are much more likely to respond to that and, and buy from you. Yeah. So, and yeah. how do you stay sharp? I mean... Because oh. it's a lot, right? Yeah. You got yeah, a lot of accounts, all at yep. different stages. You've been yeah. doing it a while. Yeah, yeah. I So the way I do is just to get back out in the field, right? I mean, the way to stay sharp is to stand in front of 40 people and do a product demonstration, right? You know, I, I mean, I, I don't do the numbers that I used to. I mean, I used to do two or three a day. Yeah. Um, now it's two or three a month, maybe. Um, but I always take the opportunity to get back out with the little guys, get back out in the plants, get my hands dirty and just, and just be you know, allow myself to be challenged by, by the customer. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the other thing, you know, these, these young guys, don't be afraid to be challenged by the customer, you know, be don't be afraid yeah. of that, you know, and, and be challenged, you know, with new things and, and putting yourself in situations where you have to perform. Right. Yeah. Um, that's what keeps me sharp. I mean, I, I try to get out and, uh, and because of that, I have guys that I, you know, that I sell machines to that call me, you know, um, they call me after a demo I gave them five years ago and say, Hey, Mike, we remember you. We're ready. We're now ready to buy, you know, and the young reps are like, Hey, why do your customer, everybody calls you what, you know, how is it so easy for you? because I've already done the work, you know, I already, already got out there and put myself out there to those guys and they remembered me. And what motivates you? What gets you up in the morning? What keeps you going through the day? Well, you know, losing, losing my business the way I did in, in 2014, um, you know, 
life, life has been really good after I've very quickly, you know, fallen into a new career and, and, um, what motivates me is just helping, you know, other customers not fall into that same trap that I do. Yeah. So, you know, it's not really money. It's not really commission. I know, you know, we're all sales guys here. <laughs> That's kind of a bad word, but, but really it's, it's, it truly is helping the customer, um, getting the deal right, not only selling something, but getting it right. Um, that's, you know, really important to me. And then also calling a guy three years later and saying, Hey, how are you doing? And he's like, Oh, this is the best investment we ever made. Yeah. I mean, th that's what drives me, right? I want that feedback from those guys. So. And how about that entrepreneurial mindset? Did that transfer well into sales? <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a, it's a good question because, um, I, I tell our young reps that I mentor, you know, when we have a territory, when we have a sales area, we should run it like our, like your own business. Um, if you actually do that and control that, that business and control that territory as though it's your own business, uh, you take a lot of the power away from not only the company that you're selling for, um, but you empower yourself to be more successful, yeah. right? Because you're motivated. It's, Having salesmen have to have an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit. They have to, right? Yeah. If you don't and you let the company tell you what they're paying you and how they're paying you and all that stuff, forget it. You're, 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 you know, you're going to be chasing your tail. You're not going to be happy. But when you take that and you make it your own, then you'll be successful. Right. Because it's that personal responsibility. When I hear a rep say, oh, I'm not trained in that yet. Let me ask right. my manager what I should do. Yeah. I've heard a rep go, I'm going to ask my manager what kind of deal we should do over here. It's like, right. why don't you take the deal you want to do to the manager to get approved? Yeah, yeah. I took, uh, I had a, a young sales rep that actually said that in a meeting. He's, he said, well, you know, the, the customer asked for a discount and it was, it was really nothing. And, and he's like, well, I'll have to go talk to my manager and, and let you know. And, you know, I told him, I said, you had him. All you had to do was, you know, split, you know, split the difference or whatever. All you had to, you were there, just do it. Ask for forgiveness later. You know, I'm kind of in our company, I'm kind of known as a cowboy. I get pretty creative sometimes. Um, and the young guys are like, how do you get away with that? And I'm like, I, I ask for forgiveness later. Right. I mean, sales dry. There's only one KPI in our business and that is sales. Right. Right. When you're bringing dollars in the door, it's amazing what you can get away with. Well, that's you know, it. You know, a PO in the hand yeah. versus a proposal. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, the PO is not perfect, but right. it's, it's the last week yeah. of the quarter. I'll take it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and especially uh, walking away or potentially stalling a deal or something because you have to go ask your manager. I mean, come on, you know, we don't, I, I tell the guys, just get the order, you know, get the order. Yeah. So, and, and that's it. And own that responsibility. And I think this yep. is something that we're, we're seeing right now. The people who did take that ownership yep. all the way through, you know, yep. their own PC, their own software that they need. Oh, yep. I got to see if I can get my manager to uh, reimburse me for this. It's like, own it. It's you are yeah. the means of production. Exactly. And yeah. Own it. It, and that mindset is so different than the employee mindset. Yep. You know, where yeah. I'm marking out my vacation. I got to take my sick days and my floaters. And you're, right. <laughs> <laughs> you're worried about time off. You're in the wrong job. Exactly. Well, and I always say, as long as I have my phone, I'm, I'm working, right? So, you know, I can go, I can go, you know, lay by a pool and have my phone and answer a few customer calls, um, you know, and I know there's something to unwinding and unplugging and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, we, that's not the, the, the job that we're in, you know, yeah. we're in a, we're in a 24 seven job and, and the rewards are there for us, yeah. you know? So, right. You get the rewards of being an entrepreneur without the, the devastating downside and risk. Yeah. Tr trust me. I understand that <laughs> risk. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. It's and, true. Absolutely true. I don't have to worry about who's, who's making payroll on Friday. You know, yeah. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about that every month. The money comes Personal into my liability. account, yeah. you know, 
So it's the best of both worlds, right? The, the ability to run a business, take ownership of that, own it, but yet not have to worry about, you know, paying everybody else. Yeah. So, and what one thing that you wish you had learned your first year in sales that you now know? Oh boy. Um, one thing I would say that, um, for me, it was understanding that the, the, the customer doesn't know what I know and what I don't know, yeah. right? So I, I never went in and said, you know, I was a former business owner. I, I used to run a business just like this, whatever. I never, I never did that. But I don't think I shared with them all of the knowledge that I could have shared with them because I assumed they would ask me, right? Yeah. They would ask me. And, and I just simply assumed that the customer knew that I was a smart guy that knew a lot about this stuff, right? So I, I was a little bit more uh, reserved and, and held back. That light bulb came on about maybe eight months into the job, yeah. you know? So, and, and I wish I had, had started, you know, from where I'm at now, right? So. And they probably get that sense by the curiosity and the interest that you have in how yeah. they view their business. Yeah, and but initially, initially, Brian, I, I didn't ask those good questions, oh, right? I, okay. You know, I, I, I towed the company line, right? Features, benefits, show up, throw up, right? I wasn't a sales guy. I was a, I was an a entrepreneur, right? Yeah. yeah, I was, I was, I was a machinist, right? I was a, I was a machine guy. So I didn't ask those questions, and it wasn't until I really started to challenge our own internal information and saying, well, wait a minute, why are we? Why are we saying this to the customer when, you know, when care. it's, when they don't care, when it's different than this, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's at that point that the light bulb, you know, kind of turned on for me. So, That's a good one. Cool. Yeah. Hey, Mike, I enjoyed this conversation. Where can people go to connect with you? Uh, so LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, I do have a YouTube channel. It's uh, uh, Mike Collier uh, on YouTube. And yeah, check me out. I have a couple three-minute videos, stuff like that that they can check out. So.